Welcome to episode 26 of the Cycling Europe podcast. My name is Andrew Sykes. I hope you've had a good Christmas and, depending upon when you're listening to this, either have or have had a good new year. It has, of course, been a very strange year, even stranger if you happen to have started a new job and have only met your new colleagues via a computer screen. That's been the experience of Sarah Mitchell, the new boss at Cycling UK. I spoke to Sarah a few days before Christmas and we'll be hearing what she has to say in a few moments. We'll also be hearing from Scottish cycling enthusiast Suzanne Forrup. I met up with Suzanne during my cycle to the four capitals of the UK earlier in the year and she told me about her experiences of being a cyclist in Scotland as well as her favourite places to cycle north of the border. However, before we hear from either Sarah or Suzanne, some breaking news. You may remember that back in June of 2020, I brought you the story of the American cyclist Maximilian J. St. George, who in 1912 and 1913 embarked upon an epic 16,000 mile journey around Europe. He visited almost every capital city of the day and subsequently wrote a book called Travelling Light or Cycling Europe on 50 cents a day. You'll have to go back and listen to the podcast for all the details. It's episode 21, by the way. But it was a fascinating subject to research. That said, I did arrive at a bit of a dead end when it came to finding any of Maximilian's descendants. There might still be someone out there who had actually spoken to Max about his trip before he died in the late 1950s. My efforts were unsuccessful. However, a few days ago, I received the following message from a man in America called Tim. Hi, Andrew. I believe you conducted a podcast recently about my grandfather, Maximilian J. St. George. It was fascinating. I've tried to find the cycling book he wrote, but without much luck. His wife, Countess Ape, my grandmother, was a painter, and I have a number of her works. Thank you very much for sharing this story. Well, since that short message arrived, I've exchanged a few emails with Tim. He was born shortly after Max died, but I'm hoping to persuade him to appear on the podcast to tell me what he knows. That might be in the next episode, so if you didn't listen to the special Maximilian J. St. George episode in the summer, now might be a good time to go back and listen to episode 21, because I hope there's more to come. Returning to episode 26... Here's my discussion with Sarah Mitchell, the new CEO of Cycling UK. I started by asking her to introduce herself. I'm Sarah Mitchell. I'm the Chief Executive of Cycling UK. I think I'm currently in my ninth week at Cycling UK. I'd never heard of Sarah Mitchell before I saw that you'd been appointed the Chief Executive. Could you give me a little bit about your background, where are you from, and also a little bit about your, your cycling credentials? Are you a cyclist, for example? Oh my goodness, of course I'm a cyclist. Yes, I'm a slightly obsessive cyclist, but I'm probably a little bit different as a cyclist from many of the people at Cycling UK in the staff team, at least. Probably quite similar to a lot of our members and normal cyclists in that I cycle day to day. So I don't actually own a car. I go everywhere by bike. Um, I have been cycling since I used to cycle to school as a teenager in Derbyshire and always cycled to work since I've been living in London so now I really miss it. I miss my commute. Um, I've done a little bit of touring, but nothing very adventurous. So I've done a few trips here in the UK, went on a cycling trip in India a few years ago, which was fantastic. It's something I'd really like to do more of, actually. So growing up in the in Derbyshire, in the Peak District, am I right? Uh, no, I actually, I actually grew up in the flat bit of Derbyshire, so probably made it a little bit easier. So between um, Derby and Nottingham, and then my parents moved to Matlock. Um, so one of the steepest hills used to be on the Milk Race, actually. It's also a quite a big training ground now on Ryber Hill, which is just outside Matlock. Very, very steep hill. So um, very tough for cycling around there. But yeah, I've also cycled in the Peak District, which is much more challenging. And did you head out into the Peak District when you were younger, when you were living up there? 
I mean, only for practical reasons, just for getting around because I didn't have a car. So um, just from getting from A to B and occasionally little trips, but nothing like the kind of adventurous big tours or group tours. I just didn't know about any of that stuff when I was when I was young, really. So it's been a real revelation finding out about the amazing tour groups that go on with Cycling UK. So what have you done prior to joining the um, I was about to say the CTC, can't say that, uh, Cycling UK? Yeah, so um, I've done a mix of different things. So most recently, I've been running charities. So I've been in the charity sector for about 15 years. I ran a social business based in London, advising companies on how to do business in a more green way, in a more ethical way, supporting their staff better. Uh, prior to that, I ran an adult social care charity. And before that, I mostly worked in housing and homelessness for some of the big national charities. And that was doing policy work. It was also doing grant making, which was really interesting. Um, but I've also worked as a government advisor, so I worked for the UK government on regulatory reform with a lot of EU countries, so doing quite a lot of work in Brussels. And I actually started off my career in Brussels, so I worked in the European Parliament and the European Commission. Um, and somewhere along the way, I also trained as an auditor. So I was a financial auditor for a couple of years. So um, it all sounds like a bit of a hodgepodge, but in a role like a chief executive in a charity, it's actually weirdly very useful to have a range of different skills and experiences. And I found that really helpful in Cycling UK. It's a very complex charity, it does lots of really interesting and quite different things. So I think having that range of finance, policy, campaigning, charities, business, sort of, I think has stood me in quite good stead so far for understanding lots of the different tentacles of the charity as it stands at the moment. Your experience there in those various areas are perfect for what you're doing now. I want to pick up on the fact that you mentioned you were living in Brussels for a while. Obviously Belgium is a is one of the, the great cycling countries in terms of participation in cycling. Mm. How did you find cycling there compared to cycling here in the UK? So very different, but it's also changed quite a lot since I lived there. So that was probably about 20 years ago. And in Brussels, in, so I lived in central Brussels where it was possible to just walk everywhere. So immediately it's a much more accessible city than many of the cities that I've lived in subsequently. But um, when I've been back to Brussels in more recent years, it's absolutely transformed. It's so much easier to get around by bike, so much more cycle friendly. But even when I lived there, going outside of Brussels, the access by bike was just very different from in the UK. It's just so normal. Um, I think people just think about cycling as a kind of accelerated walking. It's just a way to get around to work, to school, to the shops. It's not something that you have to get all the gear on. You have to have the expensive bike. Um, they do that too, and that's fun, but it's a much more kind of normal part of everyday life, which personally I think is fantastic. That's interesting because uh, I was talking to a friend who's also a cyclist today, and uh, he was talking about the Netherlands, and he said in the Netherlands, there are no cyclists. They, there are just people who use bicycles. Do you think that is a realistic ambition for, for Britain to have no cyclists, just people who use bicycles as an everyday means of transport? I think it is a realistic ambition. I think we've got to be ambitious about this stuff. And I think you've got to have vision. And I think being ambitious and having that vision is the only way you're going to bring about that change. But I think it's exactly that. I think it's that change of mindset. So not trying to set it apart as a different kind of identity, but to make it a really easy choice for all of us. And I think one of the really exciting things that Cycling UK does is thinks about all the different people who could get on a bike and the different kinds of bikes they might need and the different kinds of infrastructure they might need to make that possible which is so important. I, I think it's a very a very inclusive charity and it's interesting that you make the point in Cycle magazine about the original organisation having been originally named the Bicycle Touring Club and then they quickly changed it to the Cycling Touring Club because they didn't want to exclude people who were on tricycles uh, yeah. and that was back in the Victorian <laughs> times and it, yeah. it is an organisation, when I see the work that it does, that does try to include as many different groups of society as possible. 
Yeah, I'm really glad that you've noticed that because I feel that's one of the things that really attracted me to Cycling UK. I think that's really important to me. I feel lots, lots of people can benefit from using bikes, getting on the road on their cycles. And I think also looking back at the history of Cycling UK, that is what we've done from the start. And I was really struck, although I am actually the first female chief executive we've ever had. We've had women in Cycling UK from pretty much the inception, from really early stage of, of the club. So I think it is at its heart. Um, a very inclusive organisation and I think that's crucial for the future of cycling. You might have already answered this but what attracted you to come in to work for Cycling UK as its chief executive? I think a few different things. I think um, partly the history, because it's got an amazing history. It was really um, to have such an such an old charity with um, such roots and members that feel such a strong attachment to Cycling UK is really is incredibly valuable. But it's also got a really important future. So I think touching on what we were saying before about how there's a huge potential for cycling, how we could be a more inclusive Um, type of activity for a broader range of people it really feels like the future is with cycling at the moment I think it was even before this year with the move towards zero carbon there's a kind of obvious role for active transport like cycling in that but I think the pandemic has really shone a light on the potential for cycling for all of us across society both as um, something which helps all of our health something that's inclusive something that's good for the environment and above all something that's really fun that we can do uh, and that lots more people want to get cycling so it feels like it's a charity that's got a really exciting future that inclusivity element of it was really important to me so I think um, as my dad was always a bit frustrated with me saying he thought I was going to be a social worker uh, when I was younger he was always convinced that's what I was going to end up doing and I haven't quite done that but I think if you look at my career I've done lots of work around including communities working with disadvantaged communities people in um, poor quality housing um, people suffering um, from health conditions um, and dealing with health and um, adult social care um, provision so I think that kind of combined this combines for me that kind of inclusivity that I feel quite passionately about. Um, I think Cycling UK has got a good combination of um, practical projects on the ground that are making a difference but also I think we do some amazing and quite hard-hitting campaigning which is I think very very appealing. I think one of the things that I think is really important about Cycling UK and that particularly attracted me to it is the fact that we do genuinely work in all four nations and that's something that we we really want to do more of. Um, and of course, the brilliant team. So it was part of my interview process. I didn't get to meet anybody in person, um, but I met lots of people by teams. And I was really struck by the enthusiasm, the passion, but also the great professionalism of the team at Cycling UK. So I felt when I met them, I really wanted to be a part of their team. We'll come back to the coronavirus and 2020 in a second. But that thing about different people seeing Cycling UK in different ways, is that I was going to say, is that a problem? Is that a challenge? Is that something that Cycling UK themselves recognise as an issue? Because I'm sure if I, well, when I do see the people from my local Cycling UK group, for example, they don't even call themselves Cycling UK. For them, Mm. it's CTC. And they see themselves in a very different way to how perhaps other people, dare I say, at the headquarters in Guildford would see how Cycling UK actually is. Is that a challenge? Do you mean within the community of cyclists, so within the membership overall? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess the way that I look at it is we have a broad membership and we want the membership to be as inclusive as it possibly can be. So, yes, there are lots of different kinds of cyclists within Cycling UK even within the Cycling UK staff team there are people who do different kinds of cycling who have a different kind of passion we have members who feel really strongly about one aspect of cycling or a different aspect of cycling but as we grow and as we move into the future that that diversity of membership is is probably only going to grow so the way I the way I think about it is we're not excluding any of those people they're all welcome to be members of Cycling UK more than that we 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 warmly welcome them we really want to have that variety in our membership we want to have those different views it's really important to us we're not an exclusive charity we're not just for one particular group 
um, we really want to welcome all those different range of cyclists and views because that's the future for cycling. If we don't do that, we become a very narrow, very specific and small organisation. Whereas I really value the contribution and the different types of cycling all of those current members and potential future members can bring too. So 2020 has obviously been a, a different year for, well, for one main reason. And cycling has seen a boom. I think we saw it through our front windows. We saw more people on their bicycles in towns, uh, in the countryside. I think that's widely recognised as something that is a good thing. But we're already seeing now that beginning to move backwards. For example, the cycle lane down in Kensington that's now been taken away and councils are beginning to move back to how they were thinking perhaps six months 12 months ago how do we stop that from happening and how do we build upon the positive experiences of 2020 in terms of the uptake of cycling in the community yeah I think this is the crucial point isn't it really and I think this is where our campaigning work is so important and I think what we try to do at Cycling UK is get that combination right so to be both a friend to government and support the government when we think it's doing some really good and exciting things and the gear change report was obviously an amazing step forward for cycling this year so we shouldn't lose sight of that and we really want to make sure that the government delivers on that um, but all the changes the temporary changes into cycle infrastructure were a really important step forward um, but we also want to be a critical friend to make sure that those things continue when we provide the challenge to make sure that those um, small number of people that are criticizing cycle lanes and infrastructure structure um, don't get hold of everybody's attention so polling consistently shows that the general public supports having more cycle lanes and critically the general public supports the idea of having more people friendly towns cities and roads so um, less traffic more people so whether that's walking or cycling so I think it's really important that charities like Cycling UK and all of the other charities that we work with continue to make it clear that it's, it's the minority who have these views. So I think that's really critical to make sure that we support the councils that are doing the right thing around infrastructure. We support them to get really good infrastructure in place and all the support for people locally who want to use that infrastructure. Um, but we also continue to inspire those people who really enjoyed cycling during lockdown and encourage them to get back on their bikes so I guess one of the exciting things about that that period where the streets were really quiet and everybody was out on their bike or out walking is people had an experience of a different kind of active transport um, one where they didn't have to battle for road space or they weren't scared um, there was much more it just seemed suddenly much more accessible so I think it helps us enormously to have that that experience of a lot of different people feeling that and actually experiencing that rather than us trying to paint a theoretical picture of what that might look like for them. And that's something we can definitely build on. So, I mean, we're committed to continue to remind people of their positive experience of cycling to help them um, to continue to cycle in 2021 and beyond, but also critically to encourage those councils that are doing the right thing and having that infrastructure in place to, to make that difference. I think the bigger thing that worries me, Andrew, in the sort of medium term is more about where those political arguments go. And so far, we've had very strong political support from all parties around encouraging cycling and active transport. Um, I suppose it does worry me some of the kind of the background noise around bike clash, whether there's the risk of there being um, a kind of it, this becoming a bit of a wedge issue around the environment where certain communities feel excluded from um, uh, feel that they're being unfairly put upon by environmental issues and cycling and I think it's really important for all of us that we don't allow that to happen so we don't be, let it become a kind of them and us between those who have to use drive cars for their work and those people who would really want to cycle I think we just have to make it possible for it not to be an either or but just to provide cycling as a much easier choice for people particularly for short journeys and and that's I think it's really important that we continue to um, move away from having that sort of wedge issue created between those two different groups. It's worth bearing in mind that most cyclists are car drivers and the benefits for most car drivers by improved cycling conditions are I would have thought fairly, fairly obvious. Yeah I completely agree and although I don't own a car I do drive 
Um, and I would regularly borrow a car or hire a car if I need to, because some journeys it's just not possible to do by bike. You know, I realise I'm in a really fortunate position in that I live in relatively central London. It's possible for me to live the, the 15 minute journey life where I can cycle or walk to whatever I need. But when my parents live in Derbyshire, you couldn't really get by without a car. It's just not possible. So you have to be realistic about it. Um, but I also see here in London, having more cyclists on the road is hugely beneficial to cars because it means less traffic. <laughs> so there is a kind of immediate payoff too, because cars I and mean, bikes just take up less space, don't they? And of course, there's the huge environmental benefits. And I think that's something we shouldn't lose sight of. There's a risk, isn't there, that we become so consumed with all of our trauma around COVID-19 that we forget that the big issue for us really facing all of us is climate change and unless we radically change our behaviour and I think cycling is a really important part of that we're not going to be able to reach the government's net zero targets um, as set for 2030 and 2050. I, I sometimes wish I could just take a whole coach load of car drivers or people who are very critical of improving conditions for active travel just take them to a place like the Netherlands or Belgium or Denmark and just let them wander around in that environment that so many countries and so many cities have managed to create but which so many people in Britain are still fighting against do you think we will ever get to the point where we really embrace that kind of attitude towards active travel where really people appreciate the fact that the solution to mobility, especially in urban areas, is not the default option of thinking, I'm going to get in my car. I really hope so. I mean, I think that's, I think there isn't any reason why not. I mean, I'm a great, I'm a great believer in, in stealing other people's ideas. So I think we should definitely look to what other countries have done on cycling and active transport. And I think there's a huge amount that we that we can learn. And I think you sh it's also helpful to think about where we've come from. I mean, I've seen just here in London where I live, um, the, the transport infrastructure completely transformed over the last six months. In fact, since I've been cycling here in London for 15 years, it, it's changed so many more cyclists, so much more awareness of cyclists on the road, um, so much more provision for cyclists. Um, when I first started cycling in London, I was one of, you know, one of relatively few cyclists um, and certainly one of very few female cyclists on the road every morning. And that has really changed. You see much more variety of people, um, but you also see um, you know, vast improvements in infrastructure. And I think that's been the case in other UK cities to some extent. I know in Greater Manchester, they've done some really interesting stuff around this and particular towns and cities across the UK. So I think Although when we compare ourselves to the Netherlands, we're probably going to feel like we're, you know, we're the laggards. It's also important to appreciate what difference we have made and to take some comfort from that, I think. Um, but I do think it's, in, personally, I find it inspiring to go to Berlin or to Holland and to see all the amazing infrastructure they've got there because it sort of sees you, it sort of makes it real for you, what, what can be done and what potentially could be done here in the UK. So I think in a very less long-winded answer to your question, yes, I think we can do it in the UK and I think we should do it. And I think it's really important. In fact, I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> what kind of bike do you ride? I have um, uh, a very uh, muddy at the moment, Ridgeback commuter bike. And do you just have the one bike? Yes, I do. Yep. A few years ago, when I was travelling through Belgium, I actually stayed with Kevin Main. And he's one of your predecessors at Cycling UK. And he has a phenomenal number of bikes. I can't remember. I think it was, it was, I think it was approaching 20 bikes he had yeah. in his shed. One bicycle for the CEO of Cycling UK, it's almost too modest. <laughs> So, um, so you said you met Kevin when you were traveling. So he yeah. obviously doesn't live in London. So I challenge many people who live in a, a small house in London with no space to have more than one bike. Um, so yeah, we have to keep our bikes outside here. So yeah, I have, I have one bike, my partner has one bike. So when mine's in the, uh, in the bike shop, I use his, but yeah, I only have one bike. Don't have anywhere else to keep one road bike and commuter bike is by far the most sensible bike to have in london the real restriction for me though is if i do want to go and do um 
touring outside of London. So we really wanted to do King Alfred's Way. Uh, we don't have the bikes to do that so yeah it would be great if I you know if I had a if I had a shed I'd probably have more than one bike for sure but you know you can only read you can only ride one bike at a time well I only have one bike and I use this I use the one bike for everything for commuting yeah. for just pootling around uh, in yeah. the local area but also for traveling long distances when I when I go off so um I'm, yeah. I'm more with you than, than Kevin May, I have to say. <laughs> my brother's a little bit different. So my brother um, is a really, he's really fun of building bikes. He actually has uh, his own, I think he has two or three bikes that he's built in his shed up in, in Sale in Manchester. But he, um, he has very expensive bikes. So this is also a challenge in London. You don't want to have a bike that's too good because it, it gets either the whole bike goes or bits of the bike go. You can't leave it anywhere. So you just, I think it's just practical. Now you mention in the cycle magazine about changing punctures. Oh no, yeah. Do you know how to change a puncture? Theoretically, yes. In practice, look, I just there's no point in me pretending to be somebody I'm not. I'm a very impractical person. So I have tried to learn so many times. Um, so I, I know how to do it in theory, but I really struggle to do it in practice. Again, I was talking to the friend who mentioned who was talking about the Netherlands. He also made the point that because um, he'd also read the article, he also <laughs> made the point that um, you wouldn't criticise a car driver for not knowing how to change a wheel on the car. But somehow it seems strange that a cyclist cannot change a puncture or mend a puncture. I actually am probably nearer you in terms of my technical abilities than uh, most people. And uh, yeah, I think I think that's a that's quite a positive attitude. I think I wouldn't want people to be put off joining Cycling UK because they don't have any technical knowledge about how to build a bike. Um, I have been a cyclist for I don't know a regular cyclist since I was about eleven. So um, and I I still struggle to do that, but I haven't let it put me off cycling. That's one of the nice things about cycling is that those technical barriers, yes, they do exist, but there are people out there in the community, in shops, wherever you go who will happily mend your bike for you. And it's not compared to driving, uh, where if you change the brakes on your car, you're probably spending 500 pounds on a bike. It's a, it's a relatively cheap thing to do. We've talked about 2020 in terms of the opportunities that have arisen. Looking forward to 2021 and the initiatives that Cycling UK have got in the pipeline, uh, what are you particularly looking forward to? Well, I think a big priority for us has to be um, encouraging the government to fulfil all of their promises around gear change. So there are some um, really important commitments in there around um, supporting cycling active transport. We really want to make sure that the government continues to keep those front of mind. So anything we can do to help make cycling as accessible as possible is really crucial. So keeping that momentum going that we've had this year, but also thinking about that cycling infrastructure and supporting the development of that, because if people feel that they're safe on the roads, then that's going to encourage them to keep out and, and keep cycling. So I think that's probably going to be our big priority. So we'll be campaigning around that. We've obviously got um, elections coming up in some of the nations this year, which will be which will be really important for us to campaign on. Um, and we'll be continuing to deliver a lot of our cycle support to make cycling more accessible. So the work that we've been doing with the Big Bike Revival um, Doctor Bike here in England and then our Scottish Cycle Repair Scheme to try and make sure that people are able to get out on their bikes and those old bikes are put back on the road as much as we possibly can. So that will be really important for us in the coming year. I mentioned my local CTC group. Um, that's what they call themselves. They're not cycling UK. They're CTC here in uh, West Yorkshire. And I did go into the Facebook group and I said, right, I'm going to be speaking to Sarah next week. Have you got any questions for them? And there are a couple of questions that were uh, posted. So this this is members speaking, not me. Mm, I'm just going, yeah. I'm going to quote. I'm going to quote their words exactly. Uh, the first person said, "I became a member as I found them naturally inclusive and down to earth, which is what we picked up on earlier." Um, however, there are signs that, like many charities, they are jumping on the corporate identity bandwagon. It worries me that Cycling UK will forget its roots. So there's no question there, but uh, <laughs> um, do you think that's a fair representation? 
I actually think Cycling UK is astonishingly uncorporate. So I'm not sure what the corporate identity bit relates to. Is that something to do with the branding? I'm not really. I would imagine so. Yeah, I would imagine it was quite controversial. I don't know if you were kind of aware of when it happened, but the movement from being called CTC, which probably the vast majority of the population didn't actually know what it stood for to something a bit more obvious like Cycling UK. That was in itself quite a controversial move, wasn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, So, I mean, I guess if if that's what the question is about, the branding, I mean, I, I totally understand if people are very committed to and loved the old branding and the former organisation, then we shouldn't underestimate the huge, um, the shock that that is for that people experience when when something like that is changed. But in terms of corporateness and feeling like a kind of an, an unfriendly or um, distant sort of organisation, I really hope that's not the case. Um, I think obviously it's difficult for me to tell because my experience has been unfortunately due to the pandemic a little bit limited since I've started um, so I, I'm not it's more difficult for me to see how Cycling UK is perceived by members but within the organisation I get the sense compared with other organisations that I've worked with that it's actually not a very corporate charity at all and I think I, you and I can probably think of some examples of charities that we think of as very corporate and very sort of business-like and that isn't the feel and the culture of Cycling UK which leads me to think that maybe there's just a bit of a disjuncture between the way that we come across to our members rather than that being something that's very different and distance within Cycling UK itself. Um, So it's an interesting question. I think the point about moving away from our roots is also one that's interested me since I started really, Andrew, because I think going back to the idea of us having a really rich history and heritage in Cycling UK, that's something that I think we should treasure. So we think that's something that we shouldn't try and pretend never happened. Um, And I think having a rebrand, having a different logo, having a different name, that's not a kind of pretending that we don't have that history. Whenever I talk to people in Cycling UK, they're really aware of our history, really proud of our history. So I think one of the things that is important for us to do is to recognise what's the what's the continuity, what's the kind of what, what we can continuing within our in our history from Cycling UK and I think we've spoken about a couple of those things that have been there from the start and are there today and those are the things that I'd really like to emphasize so that idea of us being the cyclist champion um, the campaigning work that we've always done and the inclusivity that we've that we've um, demonstrated from the from the very beginning yeah and I think that kind of answers the the second point that was made again this is quoting from somebody who's in my local CTC group Uh, What do you see as the role of Cycling UK member groups and how do you support them in that role? So the member groups, I think, I I feel a little bit nervous about saying what is the role that Cycling UK sees for them, because I, I think if they're working well, then they should actually be relatively autonomous. So they should be able to organise their own rides, do what they want to do. Um, It's not a kind of, it shouldn't feel as a member group that Cycling UK is kind of dictating a particular ride they should do or who their members should be. I think it's it's for member groups to to determine that. I think um, what their role should be is... I think it is only going to work if they do something that suits their local members. Um, So we have obviously we have a range of different groups. So we have um, member groups who are kind of constituted member groups, um, which is slightly different from our affiliated member groups. So we have quite a range of different groups that are also affiliated. So it's quite a complex sort of um, web of groups that have kind of a more or less bureaucratic relationship with Cycling UK. Um, one of the things that we're looking at at the moment is how we can make that slightly less bureaucratic for some of those members, because we're aware there's quite a lot of different, um, quite sort of regulatory things that they need to fulfil at the moment. Um, so we're trying to see whether we can make that slightly less onerous than it is. Um, but in terms of the sorts of rides they do, um, or the sorts of um, work they do locally or fundraising, um, I think I think the benefit of the member groups is that they're able to do that for themselves. Obviously, there are things around um, 
contacting new members that would be really helpful for members members to do so if we have new members in their local area to get them involved with member groups would be fantastic um, but I don't really feel like I'm going to make some kind of massive I don't want to say this now some kind of massive change to member groups that's going to hugely alter them um, I think one of the things that has been quite a disappointment for me since starting is that I haven't been able to go out on any group rides with any of the member groups so far so it's been one of the challenging things about having to do everything remotely basically as soon as I started we were we were in a in a lockdown and have been pretty much since then um, so not really able to go out and meet any of the member groups so it's very much on my horizon for next year as soon as some of the restrictions start to be lifted to be able to get out and do that so um, maybe Andrew, you could invite me to your your local member group up in West Yorkshire. I don't actually go riding with them. I, I do occasionally go to their meetings, and I've given a few talks there. They are such a nice bunch of people. I think the reason why I don't actually go and ride with them is because I quite like riding by myself. I quite mm. like the independence of turning left, turning right, going straight on, and you live with the consequences if you take the wrong decision. <laughs> It's your it's your fault. If you end up cycling yeah. into the sea, then, hey, you've got nobody to blame but yourself. <laughs> I think with a group, it's kind of a bit more, you've got to debate and I, I, it's not my yeah. style. However, yeah. I do, and I have over the years, got to know quite a few of them quite well, and they are a really nice bunch of people. So I'm sure, come and see CTC Calderdale, based in Halifax, and uh, they'll oh, be delighted. Yeah. They'll be delighted to welcome you on one of their rides. Just a word of warning, but you're you're from Derbyshire. We have very <laughs> steep hills. We have very steep hills in Calderdale. So um, just be... Check um, my gears are working. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, be aware of that. Okay, just a couple more things. If I were to give you your dream bike and gave you a, well, I was going to say an unlimited amount of money, but one of the nice things about cycling is that it doesn't require an unlimited amount of money. Gave you six months to go and travel somewhere Oh, either wow. in Britain or the world or wherever, where, where would you go on your bicycle? Wow. Uh, do you know, that's just really quite a challenging question at the moment because um, I don't know whether you've had this experience, but since I can't go anywhere, I have these kind of like fantasies about all the different okay. places I could potentially go. But on the other hand, my horizons are really quite narrowed. Um, so, uh, I mean, one place that I would really like to go to is um, we were thinking of getting the ferry from Harwich over to the Hook of Holland, cycling across Holland. So I um I've been learning German during lockdown. So um I would my idea would be to if I had a six months I could go all the way across Holland and then I could do that north coast of Germany where there are all these kind of fantastic little islands that you can go out towards. I guess the only challenge with that is it is a bit flat. So maybe we should do a return journey slightly inland. Um, and get a few hills because I do like a hill because you just get fantastic perspective when you do that I know it's challenging going up but um, one of the things that I really enjoy about cycling is getting that up and down feeling so you kind of you, you, you rise up and you get a fantastic view then you can kind of come and get just get a bit of variety don't you so that might be a nice trip to do well it's not just <laughs> that it's the it's the it's also the fact that uh, if you're cycling on the flat then counterintuitively it can be really tiring because you're always cycling yeah. Whereas yeah, if you're true. in a if you're in a hilly area, you're going up and you're you're out of breath, but you get to the top, and you have a nice break for five ten minutes. Yeah, that's true. And also, um, you you tend to forget, but on those kind of coastal flats, you get a lot of headwind, don't you? So you get a lot of wind resistance, and that can also be quite challenging too. So so yeah, I guess a bit of variety would be would be quite nice. How about it outside Europe? So I haven't really done very much cycling outside Europe apart from my trip to India, which was, which was really, which was really good. Um, so I'm not sure. I mean, one of the places that I thought would be um, a very nice place to cycle was Taiwan. I saw a cycle trip to Taiwan a few years ago, which looked, which looked really interesting. Yeah, but it just seems at the moment it's so difficult to imagine being able to do anything like that. That's the the kind of the weird the weird part of it. Yeah. Do you read books by people like Mark Beaumont or Alistair Humphreys and think, oh wow, you know, one day I'm going to go off and and cross America. I'm going to go off and cycle down through Southeast Asia across Australia. Are those kind of things on your horizon? 
No, I love reading travel books, but I don't know. So the, the sort of trips that you have done, I would love reading about, but I've never been a kind of, I've never been a kind of traveller that likes going from one place to the next in succession. I guess what I prefer doing when I travel is to go to one particular place and get to know it a bit more and maybe do trips from there rather than going from um, one place to the next. I've done a few of those in kind of walking trips and when we did the cycling tour, um, but if I had a long period of time, I'd prefer to go to a few different places and stay in each place for a little bit longer, I think. I, I was in Germany last year. I think it was last year. And one of the things that you notice about cycle touring and cycling in general in Germany is the number of e-bikes and mm. the, the fact that there's also now an infrastructure. I was along the, the Rhine and the Moselle and there were, mm. there were stations where you could actually recharge your bicycle for people who were traveling along the the Moselle do you think in the next five ten years e-bikes will revolutionize our attitude to cycling here in the UK in a way that they it is happening in some continental countries I think that's really exciting isn't it and um and, and in order for them to 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 really revolutionize the way that we cycle then that infrastructure really needs to be in place so you need to have all of those refill stations you need to have all of those set up really in advance before people take it up on mass so i mean the government are making moves in that way aren't they so i think they've they're kind of talks about supporting e-bikes i think there's something in the spending review for next year around supporting e-bikes um and subsidies for e-bikes are really, it's really important, but having the infrastructure in place is really crucial too. Um, I actually think e-bikes have really interesting potential for cycling because for people, so for example, some people that I know who are in their seventies, who um, live in very hilly areas, <laughs> perhaps might not be able to cycle everywhere, but the e-bike makes those difficult bits of the journey possible for them to do short journeys, um, to and from the shop so they might be able to cycle most of it without the the kind of the boost and then to be able to do just just the difficult hill bits with the boost makes a massive difference so I think for people where it's the particularly where it's the kind of um they live in quite challenging terrain or part of the terrain is quite challenging or they're just starting off cycling e-bikes have huge potential to do that I think mm. so it makes the whole load of cycling much more accessible to a broader range of people so yeah so it is really a, a really exciting potential I think yeah, I think if, if people are able to extend their life as a, as a cyclist yeah. because they can get an e-bike and hopefully the prices will come down over the years, then I think it's fantastic. But that said, I now have a friend who's only, I think he's one or two years older than me, and he has bought himself an e-bike, which he uses when we go cycling out in the countryside. And uh, mm. it's not because he's physically not capable of doing the in inverted commas, normal cycling. Um, it's just that he recognises that actually it's an enjoyable thing to do. And, yeah. you know, if that keeps him on two wheels rather than has him sitting in a car on four wheels, then then brilliant. Um, Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. OK, now that, that's been a fascinating chat. Thank you for agreeing to do this. And, uh, Andrew, it's, been, it's been really nice to talk to you. Thank you so much for having me. It's been really interesting. Um, nice to sort of meet you in the way that I ever meet anybody at the moment. Um, and I will definitely love to come up to uh, visit Calderdale CTC. Well, well, good luck with the job. I'm sure you'll find lots of people in Cycling UK who are enthusiastic, who are very keen. At the heart of it, they all have cycling as their priority and the frustrating thing is that we can't sometimes convince other people in our society of the transformative effect that cycling can and has had in other societies around the world. Thank you very much for having me I completely agree and um, let's hope that we can make that case to a broader number of people in 2021 and beyond. Good luck to Sarah in her new job. To round off this episode of the podcast, we go back to the summer of 2020 when, for a precious few months, we were allowed to travel around the UK. Earlier in the podcast, I mentioned the early 20th century travels of Maximilian J. St. George. At the end of his book, Maximilian wrote the following words, read by Jeremy Walker. This trip to me was invaluable. 
I became intimately acquainted with the different countries of Europe and the manners and habits of the people. No train spirited me from one town to another. I observed every foot of the road. Every mile impressed itself upon my mind. Unlike other tourists, I didn't lodge at hotels. Hotel life is the same throughout the world. I lived with the people of the different lands through which I passed. I observed their houses, ate their fare, entered into their amusements and heard their stories direct from themselves. Such a trip is not so remarkable that anyone cannot make it. To stretch it out for 60 months over all of Europe on $250, however, one must be able to speak at least six of the principal languages and have a large amount of patience, perseverance, and endurance. Patience above all. But this trip could be divided into periods of three months. One trip could take up the British Isles, another Belgium, Holland, and northern France, a third Scandinavia, a fourth Germany, Austria, and Switzerland, a fifth France and Spain, a sixth Italy. Anyone during the vacation months could take one of these six trips mentioned. It can be done cheaply, and it is the only way of really seeing Europe. Well, in 2020, most of that was never going to happen. But I could at least make a start here in the UK. So in mid-July, I set off from my home in West Yorkshire to cycle to Edinburgh. After Edinburgh, I cycled to Belfast and then, after a three-week break back at home, to Cardiff and finally London. It took me 28 days to cycle to all four capitals. My plan at the time was to make a podcast about the trip. In the end, I made a film and that film is now available to watch via the Cycling Europe YouTube channel. You can find the link if you visit cyclingeurope.org forward slash films. I may not have made an entire podcast about the trip, but some of the audio recordings I did make are worth a listen, and that's certainly the case with the chat I had with Suzanne Forrup. I first met Suzanne at the Cycle Touring Festival a few years ago. She lives with her family in the coastal town of Dunbar, and she invited me to stay overnight en route to Edinburgh. The following morning she cycled with me along the John Muir Way as far as the beautiful town of North Berwick in the northern part of East Lothian. Coincidentally, Suzanne, as with Sarah, also works for Cycling UK, but here she was talking in a personal capacity about being a cyclist in Scotland. She's asked me to point out, by the way, that when she refers to the Countryside Code, She is, of course, referring to the Scottish Outdoor Access Code, which is slightly different. After so many recorded Zoom calls in the past year, it's so nice to hear something that has been recorded outside and with the birds in the sky and the distant sea crashing on the shore. I'll see you for the next episode, hopefully with that update from the descendants of Maximilian J. St. George in early 2021. I'm Suzanne, I'm a cyclist in East Lothian, I work for a cycling organisation. Um, I also write a bit about cycling, particularly with my son, and I'm a part-time cycle campaigner trying to encourage local and national government to put more effort into infrastructure development to enable more people to cycle. We met, I think a couple of years ago, for the first time at the Cy- Cycle Touring Festival. Last year was it? Yes, it was last year. That was when we met. Although you did take a photo of my tent, I think, in a couple of years beforehand. We must have uh, camped adjacent to each other. Oh, that right. year. It wasn't. It wasn't that I had particular designs on your tent or anything like that. I'd I think you thought it was very, very atmospheric. No, it was nice. It was in the in the mist one one morning. Oh, okay. I was like, that's my tent. And you're obviously you're not. You're not from Scotland, but you've lived here for quite a long time. Yes, I came as a student 26 years ago. I did leave and go back to London um, from where whence I came um, for about eight years and then returned in 2006. 
So when it when it comes to cycling in Scotland, you you know you have got quite a wide experience of where you can go and uh, cycling around Scotland. I wouldn't say a wide experience. To be honest, I enjoy cycling in Scotland. It's a beautiful country, um, great remote and, and wild places. I tend to cycle with my son, who's eight at the moment. Uh, we the last couple of years we've gone off cycle touring on islands those are the places we enjoy the most because it's safest it feels safest when there are least cars and so those have been the places I've really enjoyed being it's it's difficult as a, a parent to get any sort of time away from home when you work and and you've got a child so yeah most most of my cycle touring and cycling is is with a with a little boy at the moment so being specific which if you were to recommend to somebody places to go in Scotland for cycle touring, where specifically would be your, say, top three places to go to? I have to give a shout out to where I live. East Lothian is lovely. We've got a lot of uh, very quiet back roads. It's not too hilly. There are cafes everywhere. Uh, there's some lovely routes you can take and we've got plenty of accommodation as well as... Um, campsites and B&Bs. Dumfries and Galloway is often overlooked. I think a lot of tourists go straight up north. Um, of all Tourists of all sorts tend to go straight up north to the mountains and places like Dumfries and Galloway get overlooked but again it's, it's very similar to East Lothian in lots of ways. There's lovely back roads, um, low traffic roads. It's got less cafes if that matters to you uh, but it's a really nice quiet beautiful place to be and you can feel feel remote but also feel connected because there are towns and villages and, and people there so uh, that's beautiful and both of those places East Lothian and Dumfries and Galloway are obviously quite accessible for people traveling from further south in Britain yes I mean they're the easiest places I suppose to, to get to East Lothian's on the the main line um, from London and you can get to uh, Dumfries from, from Carlisle very easily um, if you want to go further and, and more remote Orkney has a very special place in my heart I went there with my son a couple of summers ago and we love that just the, the ferries the wild beauty the lack of cars when you get out to the smaller islands once you're away from sort of mainland Orkney it's incredibly beautiful uh, I feel that real sense of rugged um, remoteness um, and very hospitable, lovely people. It's a really, really enjoyable place to cycle. Uh, it'd be a shame, yeah, it'd be lovely to have more people there um, experiencing Orkney. And in terms of accommodation, when you go to places like Orkney, is it is it wild camping, or do you do you stay B and B, or are there other hotels up there that you can use? There's all of them. I think if you you can wild camp, there's a very low population density, so you can keep out of out of people's ways. I mean, when you wild camp, you really need to uh, be very mindful of people that live there and make sure you're um, being a responsible user of the countryside and arriving late, leaving early, not lighting inappropriate fires, certainly not leaving rubbish. You really need to be responsible about that. There are campsites. Um, we stayed in a, a campsite in, in Kirkwall, really enjoyed that. Um, there's plenty of uh, B&Bs and, and hotels as well. It's always good to, to book in advance. Depends on where you are, but yeah, there, there's a lot of variety out there for all sorts of, of budgets and different sorts of travelling experiences. Because one thing that does make cycling in Scotland different is the fact that you can wild camp and you can, in theory, as long as you abide to the rules that you've just been mentioning, you can camp really wherever you like within within reason obviously which is not something that you can do really for most of the rest of the UK Yes you can it's a, a right of responsible access so our access legislation is quite distinctive I'm not an expert but wild camping is, is an option but you need to be responsible about it and unfortunately I think what we've seen recently and there's been lots of social media posting about this is inappropriate camping lighting fires coming by car um, antisocial behavior I 
I've certainly seen a lot of um, posts from uh, eight different agencies reminding people of the access rules and making sure that everyone is safe and sensible and abides by the countryside code. Um, it feels like very sensible, um, common sense ways of being. You need to look at, you know, take your rubbish away, um, not to disturb wildlife, not to light fires where that's dangerous and not to congregate. I mean, COVID has had a whole other load of issues with it. Um, but, it, you know, while camping is not like camping at a campsite, you really need to make sure you are away from other people where you're not going to be disturbing uh, wildlife or, or other people or leaving rubbish because there is, there is no one else to collect it. If you bring it, you have to take it away with yourself. The other option in Scotland could be um, using a bothy. Do you have any experience of bothying on a bike? And is it, is it a popular option for people travelling by bikes? I'm not sure if it's popular. Certainly lots of people talk about it. It's a lovely book produced a couple of years ago the Bothy Bible which perhaps has encouraged more people to do it I only have one experience of bothering and that was earlier in this year in February my pal um, we had an interesting experience I think it's, it's probably that the, the Bothy perhaps wasn't as remote enough we had uh, some other company some young uh, lads who had quite a lot to drink also um, in the Bothy and that was quite a intimidating experience for two women I'm sure they didn't mean any anything by it but they were they were very loud and that made us feel very uncomfortable in the middle of the night um, it was six miles away from any other habitation um, so we were we were uncomfortable then by that experience I think we had we been on our own it would have been quite different but um, I think bothying is for a particular type of traveller you need to bring everything that you need there is obviously no facilities no running water no, ins no, no toileting facilities so again you need to abide by the rules um, understand what it is you're going to and make sure that you you leave it in a in a good condition as you would wish to find it and how supportive are the Scottish government when it comes to supporting and developing cycling infrastructure in all its various forms, whether it's tourism, whether it's commuting, whether it's infrastructure, are they generally on board? Are they invested money in in things which will develop cycling? They are supportive. We had a, a doubling of the active travel budget a few years ago. That started to make a difference, I think, to the way local authorities are, are perceiving the importance of cycling. Um, so the money for those sorts of things is channeled through Sustrans, the charity Sustrans Scotland. Um, local authorities bid for the money and then do local developments after consultation. So we are seeing a lot more infrastructure plans. I think it's it's becoming an issue that people are talking about, whereas 10 years ago walking and cycling were very much on the fringes of political thought, I think. Um, so yes, I feel Scottish Government is positive. Could they do need more? Yes, of course they could. You can always put more money, um, more focus into it. Um, I'm sure everyone in active travel would like to see another doubling of the budget, um, particularly now. I think a lot of people have really enjoyed walking and cycling during lockdown, seeing the freedom that that brings. But now the cars are returning. We'll see a lot of those people put their bikes away back into sheds again, unfortunately. So this is really a key time to make sure that all of our uh, governments, whether that local authorities or Scottish government, is really seeing that the population wants it. I think that is probably my key message is that anyone who walks and cycles should make sure that they tell their local politicians in particular that they wish for more emphasis and more investment to be put in into infrastructure um, so that everyone can, can walk and cycle safely in Scotland.